Hey everyone, this lesson is on chaperone-mediated autophagy, or CMA. So in a previous lesson, we talked about macroautophagy, which is the bulk degradation of cellular components utilizing autophagosomes. But with chaperone-mediated autophagy, as its name suggests, it actually uses chaperones. Now, CMA is considered to be a selective degradation process, and it selects particular soluble proteins within the cytosol of the cell. And it chooses proteins that have a specific consensus sequence, and that consensus sequence is a KFERQ consensus sequence. Now, the KFERQ consensus sequence is simply a sequence of amino acids on a protein. And that sequence of amino acids consists of the Q, which represents glutamine, and that glutamine residue is actually flanked by a basic amino acid. So the R would be a basic amino acid, so the R can represent an arginine, or a lysine, so any basic amino acid can be beside the glutamine. And then beside that basic amino acid, then you'd have an acidic amino acid, the E. So the E would actually represent a glutamic acid, but it can be other acidic amino acids as well. And then beside that acidic amino acid is a bulky amino acid, which is represented by the F, and that can be amino acids such as phenylalanine or tyrosine. And then beside that, is a basic or bulky amino acid. So it can be either basic or bulky, and that's represented by a K. So that can consist of any basic amino acids such as arginine lysine, or it can be a bulky amino acid like phenylalanine. And here's a color coding schematic that hopefully better simplifies the KFERQ consensus sequence. Now, if a chaperone in CMA actually detects this particular sequence of amino acids in a soluble protein, it can actually target that protein for degradation in CMA. And about 30 to 40% of soluble intracellular proteins consist of this particular KFERQ consensus sequence. So CMA can actually target about 30 to 40% of soluble intracellular proteins for degradation. And like all forms of autophagy, degradation occurs within the lysosome. Now, in contrast to macroautophagy, which can occur in short periods of fasting, CMA typically becomes activated or peaks in its activation in prolonged periods of fasting and typically greater than 12 hours of fasting. Now, CMA function is decreased in some situations, and one of those situations is the normal aging process. So it's been shown that as we get older, our CMA function actually decreases. And interestingly, some diets have also been shown to decrease CMA function. In particular, the Western diet of high-fat, high-sucrose actually has been shown to decrease CMA function as well. And because of this, CMA function has actually been implicated in heart disease and neurodegenerative diseases. So how does CMA actually occur? As its name suggests, it requires chaperone proteins. And one of those chaperone proteins is HSE70, or heat shock cognate, of 70 kilodaltons. This is the protein that is responsible for recognizing that KFERQ peptide sequence. Now HSC70 is associated with a couple of other proteins and these include HIP which is HSC70 interacting protein and it's associated with HSP40 or heat shock protein 40. So HIP actually allows HSC70 to be associated and interact with HSP40. Now there's also another protein known as HOP, or HOP, which is the HSC70, HSP90 organizer protein. And this, as its name suggests, actually links HSC70 with HSP90. And there's also another protein involved in this complex known as BCL2-associated ethanogene 1, or BAG1. Now all of these proteins play specific roles. Now as we've mentioned before, HIP, or HIP, is HSC70 interacting protein and it allows HSC70 to interact with HSP40. Now HSP40 has an important function in that it actually activates the ATPase activity of HSC70. And as we've mentioned before, the protein HOP has a particular function in that it allows HSC70 to interact with HSP90. Now HSP90 has an important function as well. It prevents unfolded proteins from aggregating together in the process of CMA selection. So as we mentioned before, HSC70 is the 
chaperone that actually recognizes the KFERQ consensus sequence. And if there's a variety of unfolded proteins involved in this interaction, HSP90 prevents those unfolded proteins from aggregating together. And then finally, BAG1 has been shown to be a regulator of HSC70 activity. It can either activate or inactivate HSC70 depending on the circumstance. Now this entire protein complex is known as the chaperone complex. So now that we know the chaperone complex, it's important to look at the lysosome and what is involved at the lysosomal level. Now an important protein for lysosomal function is VATPase, and this is actually a hydrogen ion pump. It acidifies the lysosome. If this pump does not work properly, if the lysosome does not become acidified, the lysosomal function is decreased, and this ultimately leads to a decrease in CMA function. So CMA requires an acidified lysosome. Now inside of the lysosome, there are particular proteases known as cathepsins, which actually break down protein cargo from macroautophagy or chaperone-mediated autophagy. So we require adequate amounts or adequate function of cathepsins for chaperone-mediated autophagy to occur. Now there's also an important protein at the lysosomal membrane, and that is the lysosome-associated membrane protein 1, or LAMP1. This protein is involved in lysosomal stability and lysosomal binding purposes. And this is actually one of the most, if not the most, abundant lysosomal membrane protein. Now another very important lysosomal membrane protein involved in CMA is LAMP2A, or lysosome-associated membrane protein 2A. This protein is required for the translocation of chaperone-mediated autophagy cargo into the lysosome, and we'll talk about that in a bit. And the last one I want to talk about in this lesson is LAMP2C, and we'll talk about the function of LAMP2C in a moment. Now, in the process of CMA, when the chaperone complex via HSC70 recognizes a soluble protein with a KFERQ consensus sequence, it will bind to that protein, and it will bring that protein to the lysosome. What happens is that this protein, this KFERQ protein cargo, will be bound, will bind to LAMP2A receptor. The next step is an unfolding process whereby the protein cargo becomes unfolded, allowing that protein to be easily translocated into the lysosomal lumen. Interestingly, this translocation process, bringing that protein cargo through the LAMP2A receptor into the lysosomal lumen, requires another protein inside the lysosome. And that protein just happens to be HSC70 again, and this time it's actually lysosomal HSC70. Lysosomal HSC70 helps to bring and translocate that protein cargo through the LAMP2A receptor and into the lumen of the lysosome, whereby that protein can then be degraded by cathepsins. Now this process of translocation through the LAMP2A receptor is the rate limiting step of CMA. And because it is the rate limiting step in CMA, LAMP2A is regulated. And it is regulated by actually being stored within the lysosome. So in certain circumstances, when CMA is not activated, the subunits of the LAMP2A receptor are located in a cholesterol rich domain within the lysosome. And these LAMP2A subunits are actually degraded by a specific cathepsin known as cathepsin A. Now when CMA is activated, if there's prolonged starvation or there's some cellular stress that activates CMA, these LAMP2A subunits can then translocate to the lysosomal membrane with the help of lysosomal HSP90. The subunits of LAMP2A then multimerize to form what is known as the LAMP2A receptor. And because LAMP2A is critically important for CMA function, a deficiency in LAMP2A can cause a particular disease, and that disease is known as Dannon disease. Dannon disease is an X-linked recessive disorder. And again, as I mentioned before, it's due to a deficiency of LAMP2A. Dannon disease is also known as glycogen storage disease 3B, and it leads to a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy along with other symptoms as well. So because LAMP2A is so important in CMA function, what about LAMP2B and LAMP2C, for instance? Well, as you see here, I didn't actually put LAMP2B in this schematic because LAMP2B has not been well characterized at this point. 
but LAMP2C has been shown to actually play a role in RNA and DNA degradation. And interestingly, this process is HSC70 independent, so it actually does not require the chaperone complex that the classical CMA process requires. So how does it actually bind and how does it actually process RNA and DNA? It's been shown that LAMP2C has a cytosolic tail that allows the LAMP2C receptor to bind to RNA and DNA, leading to the translocation of RNA and DNA into the lysosome for degradation. So in summary, CMA function is decreased by the aging process. As we get older, CMA function decreases. Particular diets, especially the Western diet, has been shown to decrease CMA function. But certain things increase CMA function, particularly prolonged starvation. And I didn't mention before, but oxidative stress can increase CMA function as well. And CMA leads to a recycling of specific nutrients, particularly about 30 to 40 percent of soluble proteins are recycled through CMA. And this all leads to the cell being able to maintain a proteostasis or a proteostatic environment. And if CMA is working properly, we can see why it can maintain health. But if the CMA function is not working properly, we can see why it can lead to disease. Anyways, guys, that was a lesson on chaperone mated autophagy. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.